Good afternoon, and welcome back to the Washington Foreign Press Center, and a warm welcome to those who are in New York joining us. Uh, my name is Orna Bloom. I'm director of the Foreign Press Centers, and I'm pleased to welcome you to a special briefing today. Pleased to welcome Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Communications, Ben Rhodes, who will be briefing today on the Obama administration's foreign policy record. A kind reminder before we begin that when uh, you ask questions, please state your name and outlet for the record. And with that, Mr. Rhodes. Uh, great, thanks. Well, I really just wanted to come one last time uh, um, and take your questions and, and also just thank everybody from the uh, foreign press. Uh, um, you know, we've tried over the last eight years um, uh, in this kind of very fractured media environment to make sure that we're um, providing access to the foreign press as best we can um, and uh, have always enjoyed working with you as I know the NSC staff has um, and figured uh, many of you will be wrapping up our administration and looking forward to the next one. Um, so I'm happy to take your questions on, uh, on anything that's on your mind. So uh, why don't we open up? Thank you very much. Silvia Yusuf from Advice Newspaper. And my question is on Cuba. You just came back from a trip to Cuba, and Cuba, the decision to uh, uh, end the dry food, uh, mm. uh, wet food policy is one of the last decisions of President Obama. So my question is, first, um, in the transition uh, works now with the new, with the new administration, how, how is the Cuba talks going on? I mean, what, what's the policy? What's your take and what have you recommended? One. And second, there's a lot, a lot of requests um, from the Cuban society, Cuban church, etc., to make an exception for those Cubans that were surprised by the announcement in mm -hmm. the middle, people who sold everything, who were already somewhere between Cuba and the U.S., yeah. and they're now stranded and they don't know where to go. Is their administration willing to take a look at that and make eventually a provision on, the, on those people? Well, on your, on your second question, uh, we looked hard at this issue. Um, uh, the, the problem that we identified is that um, in making the change, the only way to signal that it was in force immediately um, and to avoid uh, a potentially uh, disruptive and um, dangerous uh, flow of, of migrants to our borders was to make the change uh, effective immediately. And it would, we looked at the issue and it, it would have been um, basically impossible to determine precisely who was in a population of people who were in uh, Central America uh, how you could distinguish that from other Cubans who've been out of the country and other places. Um, it, it, there was just no orderly way to do that. A and our fear was that in indicating that there was an exception for some population that we could identify, that we would have a migratory crisis because um, uh, people would seek to try to present themselves at the border as being in that population. Um, so. Again, we share the, the concerns, um, but there, there were potentially dangerous implications uh, for us to suggest that a, a sizable number of Cubans who are already outside of Cuba would be able to be paroled into the country without knowing exactly how we could identify what that population was. Um, uh, we do, however, want to work with the Central American governments uh, as well as the Cuban government uh, to try to determine if we can provide some humanitarian assistance in this regard. Uh, and so that's something um, that we've looked at. We have, um, you know, a sizable assistance package already to Central America. Um, and then I also know that there's private interest in providing some support to Cubans who uh, have, uh, in some cases, sold significant amounts of their um, possessions uh, to be there. So. Uh, we're, we're trying to address it as a humanitarian issue, um, but as an immigration issue, uh, it, it just proved too difficult to, um, to be able to isolate and know f for certain uh, that a certain population could get an exception to the change without causing confusion and potentially 
uh, a dangerous uh, rush uh, of migrants. On the first question, um, we've, uh, as we have on other issues, you know, briefed the incoming administration about uh, our Cuba policy. Um, we provided them with an up, uh, a notification ahead of time about the wet foot, dry foot change. Um, they did not express any opposition to that change. Um, you know, more broadly, um, you know, I, I can't say for certain what the incoming team's approach is going to be. Um, you know, there's been a diversity of views expressed by uh, both the president-elect and members of his team. Um, you know, I think the point that we've made to them is that uh, their focus on economic and commercial opportunities for the United States in our foreign policy um, should correspond with what we're trying to do in opening up more space for American businesses and American travel to Cuba uh, so that there's uh, potential benefits that are consistent with their uh, expressed view of a foreign policy priority of promoting American jobs and American businesses, that there are very tangible benefits uh, in terms of the cooperation we have bilaterally with the Cubans. We just recently, uh, as I was down there, signed a MOU on counterterrorism, counter narcotics, uh, uh, counter trafficking. So the the focus on security that they're bringing to bear, uh, I think, would benefit from uh, working with the Cubans. Uh, and lastly, that uh, the Cuba policy cannot be seen in isolation from our policy in Latin America, um, and that we have removed a very significant uh, irritant between the United States and the countries uh, of our hemisphere. Um, and if we were to roll back the Cuba policy, uh, I think that would have uh, repercussions not just in Cuba, but uh, it would significantly set back our position and our ability to cooperate with countries across the hemisphere. Um, so, you know, uh, that, that, would, that has been, uh, I think, uh, the case we've made publicly and um, expressed to different officials. Um, insofar as there are concerns about the human rights uh, situation in Cuba, you know, we share those concerns and, um, you know, our belief continues to be that we're better positioned to address this with an embassy, with relationships with the Cuban government, uh, and that, frankly, uh, the progress that's been made among uh, the development of a private sector in Cuba um, and the incremental advances of Internet access and the interconnectivity between Cubans and the rest of the world, that benefits the Cuban people as well. Um, so they, the, the, uh, ultimately, the empowerment of the Cuban people is best served by uh, continuing this, uh, this policy. They could choose to emphasize different things than we did, but um, my, my hope and expectation is that um, it's sufficiently in America's interest that uh, they continue at least, uh, you know, important elements of what we're doing and, um, and recognize the cost of um, seeking to turn back other elements. Thank you. This is Lena Argyuk, Greek Republic TV. Almost uh, since the president took office, Greece is in the midst of recession. So now looking back, uh, does the president feel that uh, he did uh, throughout his presidency, he did enough to help Greece? And I'm asking that because the situation remains almost the same after seven years. Thank you. Well, you know, I think we do feel good um, you know, that we were an advocate for Greece. Um, you know, we were often at odds with some of our key European partners in uh, counseling uh, an approach that uh, was less punitive and uh, put more of an emphasis on growth. Um, there are times at which we felt that they, that should have been more the approach that was taken. Um, ultimately, it was not our decision to make. Um, these were principally negotiations that had to take place between Greece and um, its EU partners. Um, and so we were essentially a supporting actor in those discussions. Um, you know, but I do think that uh, you know, we consistently made the point that for Greece and for other um, uh, European economies, uh, particularly in Southern Europe that were suffering, um, you know, we, we consistently advocated for an approach that uh, allowed for more space for growth and that limited uh, the pain that accompanied austerity. That's not always uh, the approach that was taken, um, but I do think, you know, Greece uh, still has uh, a chance uh, to pursue a recovery when the president was there, he and Prime Minister Cyprus talked about some of the efforts that are being taken to promote greater innovation and entrepreneurship in the economy, uh, things that could yield more job creation for young people. Ultimately, that's going to have to be the, the path for Greece, but, you know, we'd like to see, um, you know, a, a resolution um, over time to the issues between Greece and the EU um, that allows for the, the economy to grow. So 
I think we feel like we were consistently an advocate for Greece, that uh, we did avoid um, a Eurozone crisis, um, uh, but we recognize that people in Greece have, have sacrificed greatly and uh, we're hopeful that uh, going forward that they'll, they'll be able to uh, get back onto a pathway to growth. Thank you. If I may briefly fo follow up on Greece, do you feel, um, Katerina Soku with Greek Daily, Kathimerini, uh, do you feel that uh, the Grexit danger is uh, the exit from the Eurozone is now uh, gone for good? Do you feel that you contributed uh, through your, uh, your advice and counseling to the Europeans for Greece to stay in the Eurozone? Thank you. We do. I mean, with the time that we had, there were times when that looked very uh, likely. Um, and, you know, when I look back to 2011 and 2012, um, you know, there was a great deal of uncertainty as to whether or not Greece would be able to stay in the Eurozone uh, and whether or not the entire Eurozone would go into some type of broader crisis uh, along the lines of what we saw um, uh, in the financial crisis. Um, you know, what I think uh, we were able to do working with uh, the other European uh, uh, countries is to take enough action to avert the worst outcomes um, so that uh, at each juncture uh, enough was done to keep things from going off the rails uh, and to uh, s try to maintain some stability um, in the Eurozone. But again, I don't think enough was done to promote the type of growth uh, that we've encouraged uh, Europe to pursue. Um, so, so in that regard, I do think just the fact that Greece still has a future within the Eurozone uh, is positive and wasn't uh, in any way uh, preordained back in 2011, 2012. Um, I, you know, I think the, the Greek people at diff different junctures have shown a lot of courage in taking very tough decisions and doing very hard things. Um, uh, frankly, they, you know, they deserve probably more credit than they get. Um, uh, I think it, it, you know, there's a, an unfair to generalize that um, Greece wasn't stepping up to the plate given the hardships that people had to take on. Um, and, and again, my hope is that ultimately uh, that is rewarded with uh, a return to growth and people will be able to look back at this chapter and say, as dark as it was, the, the, the worst uh, outcomes were avoided um, and Greece was able to uh, essentially uh, reorient and rebuild a, an economy that could deliver um, greater job creation and, and, and growth for, for, um, for the Greek people. Yeah. Namo uh, Abdullah with Rudao. It's a news agency in Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, I have a two-far question. Uh, uh, more than two years ago, President Barack Obama outlined his policy or strategy to quote-unquote degrade and ultimately destroy ISIS. Um, I want to get your assessment of how degraded ISIS is now as President Obama is leaving office, uh, not just geographically. I know he, they have, it's been pushed back of some g areas, but, but also do you have a way to gauge the degree of threat ISIS poses to the West now? Has that threat been degraded? And the second part of the question, how important was the role played by the Kurdish forces in both Iraq and Syria against the uh, ISIS? So I, I think uh, ISIL has been degraded um, substantially um, in a number of ways. Um, first, uh, they have lost significant amounts of territory, um, nearly half of the territory they controlled in Iraq and Syria. And that includes major population centers. Um, uh, when you look in, in, uh, at Iraq and Ramadi and Sinjar and Tikrit um, and Heat, uh, you know, they, they've been steadily rolled back and are now being squeezed in, in Mosul, their remaining major population center. Uh, and similarly in Syria, when you look at where they were from the time that they were seeking to overrun Kobani, they've now lost that entire border region and are pushed back into Raqqa, um, where uh, we're beginning to, to squeeze them. Um, more broadly, though, that's had uh, effects in other ways. Um, a lot of the magnet for uh, ISIL recruitment was the sense that they were on the move uh, and that they were establishing a caliphate. Uh, I think that that myth has been blown up, um, that, that there's no longer this triumphalism uh, and that it's clear that, um, you know, ultimately they're going to lose the territory they hold and they're going to be um, uh, what they 
are, which is a terrorist organization, not a, not a state. Um, and we've seen both because of that dynamic and because of cooperation on foreign fighter flows and in efforts to delegitimize uh, and expose the ISIL narrative uh, with many partners around the world, we've seen a significant decrease in the flow of foreign fighters. Uh, and that's the clearest indicator uh, that you have, that the, the allure is not what it was two or three years ago, that there are just a lot less people who are traveling to Iraq and Syria. Um, and, and that, I think, speaks to a degradation of ISIL. Um, they've also lost a significant amount of their financing, um, which uh, was essential to their uh, efforts to try to establish governance in places. Um, and look, part of this was their own, um, uh, you know, their own bankrupt and nihilistic ideology. They, they, they could not govern the places that they were in. They, they, they were exposed as, the, you know, the, the terrorists and, and thugs that they are when they sought to exert control over local populations who then rejected them. Um, so I think there's a, a, a significant amount of progress. At the same time, the threat persists um, in part because as they've lost territory and as they are no longer able to really, um, you know, compete in, in a military conflict on the ground with the coalition air power and the partners that we have fighting ISIL on the ground, they're resorting to, to being uh, a terrorist organization that seeks to garner uh, attention and prestige uh, not from governing, but from carrying out attacks, particularly in Europe. Um, so I think that that's the nature of the threat going forward to the West is, um, you know, people who might have traveled to Syria and Iraq to fight um, are now seeking to carry out these uh, attacks that we've seen in far too many European countries and other uh, places around the world. And that, that becomes a more traditional intelligence and law enforcement challenge and it also necessitates continued efforts to work with Muslim-majority countries around the world to, to push back against uh, the ideology uh, of ISIL. Um, in that effort, the Kurdish forces were absolutely indispensable. Um, and it, at, in the darkest days, uh, in when we first intervened um, and were seeking to organize um, a mix of security forces, um, you know, the Kurdish uh, Peshmerga forces in, in northern Iraq really be, began the first pushback against ISIL to hold that line um, when we intervened to save the Yazidis in Sinjar, um, to obviously protect Erbil, and then to start to push back. But the other important thing in Iraq that happened is they worked well with Iraqi security forces. Um, and th this whole campaign in Iraq only works when there's a unified ability to coordinate between Baghdad and Erbil, between Iraqi security forces working with Kurdish forces, uh, working with, in, in some cases, Sunni tribes, um, and, the, um, and some of the, uh, the, the, and then being careful about the role that certain militias play in that effort. And so it's been a complex um, uh, array of actors working together on the ground to push back against ISIL. Uh, and I think the, the Kurds have proven to be both in effective fighters, um, but also they've uh, they've worked um, in effective coordination with uh, the government under Prime Minister Abadi in Baghdad um, uh, in this campaign, um, and that you know part of the sea change there was when Prime Minister Abadi came in uh, to replace Prime Minister Maliki, who had I think had his relations soured completely with the Sunni community and uh, significantly with the, the Kurdish community inside of Iraq. In Syria, similarly. Um, you know, the initial gains in uh, Kobani, uh, which I think gave a bit of a shot in the arm to people who were pushing back against ISIL in Syria. Uh, we could not have done that without cooperation with Kurdish forces. But as in Iraq, what's also been important is uh, those Kurdish forces have uh, worked with Arab forces increasingly, uh, particularly as we got into um, parts of Syria that are uh, majority Arab instead of Kurd. And, and they've been, um, you know, careful to not, for instance, uh, hold areas in which uh, there's an Arab majority and, and to, uh, to work with us um, and other Arab partners uh, to determine the most effective way to balance all the various equities um, in, in northern Syria uh, with uh, Turkey as an ally of the United States um, and uh, with the, the need to have a, 
a multi-sectarian coalition. So um, it, it's been uh, indispensable to have Kurdish partners in this fight, uh, but part of the reason why uh, that's been effective is that they've also worked across uh, lines of sect and community in ways that um, you know, allow the campaign to continue to move uh, forward. Uh, yeah, we'll take a question from New York. Um, oh, your mic's not on. Well, sorry, you, you guys don't have your mic on in New York. No? Should we come back? All right, we'll come back. We'll come back to you. We'll 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 seek to address the difficulty, and we'll come back in a few minutes. Yeah, here. meeting with uh, Chinese President Xi. Uh, I wonder if you could shed some light what's the final message from this administration and what advice you could give the next administration in terms of engaging your Chinese counterparts. And secondly, as uh, President-elect Trump um, firmly said he is going to withdraw from TPP. So realistically, what's the future of the Asian rebalance strategy? Mm -hmm. Well, number one, uh, I think that the U.S.-China relationship is the most important bilateral relationship in the world. Um, it's indispensable um, to addressing just about any issue that we care about. Um, and I think we're remarkably proud of what we've accomplished with the Chinese. Um, most of our signature foreign policy uh, initiatives and achievements uh, were built in part on U.S.-Chinese cooperation. There is no Paris Climate Agreement without the U.S. and China leading that effort um, with the agreement we reached in Beijing. There's no Iran deal without Chinese cooperation on sanctions and then diplomacy with Iran. Uh, there's no ability to um, uh, deal with the global economic crisis uh, and return the global economy to a pathway to growth without the U.S. and China uh, cooperating. Uh, we expanded our cooperation on areas like health and development, um, where we want China to play a bigger role. Um, so uh, across a host of issues, uh, you know, I think because of the, the regular consultation and the relationships that we developed, um, we got a tremendous amount of things done with China. Uh, we had always a balance sheet where there are uh, areas of tension, though. Um, I think for us, uh, the South China Sea has grown uh, as an area of tension. Uh, I think it's an area that should concern us going forward because I think neither the U.S., China, or our Southeast Asian partners uh, have any interest in seeing that uh, get on a pathway towards uh, conflict and escalation. So I think um, it, it's going to take a lot of effort uh, to try to resolve those issues peacefully. Cyber uh, is another area where it, what we've at least been able to do is build greater mechanisms for, for dialogue and exchange on the issue. Um, but I, our advice would be to see that this relationship is essential to anything you want to get done, whether it relates to the global economy or global issues like climate change, uh, the security situation in the Asia Pacific. Uh, if, if this relationship is functioning well, um, everything is easier. Um, if, it's, if it's not, everything is harder. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be firm on uh, certain issues. Um, uh, in the South China Sea is, is one. Um, and and any time we, we see China, China beginning to press up against international norms like um, the, you know, peaceful resolution of disputes under international law, um, you know, we, we've been very clear about that. But I think there's just much more to be gained from pursuing cooperation when we can with China rather than seeing it as, as, as an adversary. I think that would be very dangerous um, uh, for, for, every, for the whole world, uh, frankly. Um, in terms of uh, your other question was the TPP. I think that's an enormous mistake. Um, it, the United States is only shooting itself in the foot um, uh, if we walk away from TPP. Um, it, frankly, uh, it benefits China um, because uh, it puts them in a stronger position to shape uh, the future of trade and commercial relations in Asia Pacific. Um, it, it removes us from the table. Um, so economically and strategically, I think it's, it's an enormous error. 
um, and it, it also kind of willfully ignores the fact that TPP addresses a lot of the very concerns that have been raised about trade agreements. Um, you know, it prioritizes uh, labor and environmental standards. Um, it addresses some of the issues of dispute resolution that were missing in NAFTA. Um, so I think it's the wrong answer to some of the concerns that have been raised about trade over the last decade. You know, it's kind of an interesting shift. A lot of things are interesting in the United States right now that, you know, a pro very progressive, probably the most progressive Democratic president in decades is the advocate for trade. Um, but that's precisely because we believe that the agreement uh, has progressive values built into it. Um, what I think will happen, you know, I, I, I think that the countries will cut deals without us. Um, and frankly, maybe the TPP countries will just uh, find a way to move forward with TPP without the United States. Uh, and my hope would be at some point there's a return to that. I don't think that it's a sum total of the Asia rebalance. It's a, it was a key part of it. Um, but I think we elevated the profile of the Asia Pacific in our foreign policy. We resourced uh, our defense budget around the Asia Pacific as a priority. We really invested in relationships in Southeast Asia that I think have been transformed, um, you know, both with ASEAN as a collective, but, you know, the U.S. Vietnam relationship is now one of the fastest growing partnerships we have in the world. Uh, very substantive changes uh, to it, like removing the prohibition on uh, lethal weapons sales, increased commercial and people to people ties. The opening to Myanmar um, uh, has completely transformed our relationship with that country. Um, so, you know, I think the Asia rebalance manifests itself in um, a, a lot of ways that go beyond TPP. It would have been nice to have that because it kind of captured exactly what our approach is, which is rules-based agreements that promote prosperity and stability in the region and ensure that the United States has a seat at the table. Um, I would hope that the incoming administration would uh, continue the practice of uh, participating in forums like the East Asia Summit and APAC at a head of state level. I think it's hard to under, underestimate importance because it's a forcing mechanism. You know, it, al it allows us to develop agendas with these countries. Um, uh, both multilaterally and bilaterally. Um, so uh, that, too, will be a key indicator to watch. Uh, do, they, do they sustain that type of high-level engagement, um, not just with China and, and Japan and the Republic of Korea and Australia and you know, our allies, but also with the, the ASEAN countries? Uh, should we try New York again? or You want to see if your guy's mic works? No? All right. So, sorry, sorry. I'm, um, I'll stay here. Yep. Hi, thank you. I'm Lucia Leal with uh, FN News. I wanted to ask you first on Guantanamo. Uh, do you think we can expect further action by President Obama on that before he leaves office? And secondly, on Cuba, I wanted to, uh, if, to see if you could clarify what you meant when you said that, um, on, uh, that you wanted to work with governments in the region to determine if you can provide some humanitarian assistance to the Cubans who were almost there when the what for dry foot uh, change took place. Um, do you mean some sort of clemency or maybe expedited applications for asylum? No, no so uh, to be very clear, because it's a important question, I, I do not mean in the immigration procedures because I think, again, uh, it is just too difficult to carve out an exception and to, to know what that population is without, and being able to verify that, without prompting a migratory crisis potentially, because different people uh, who may be coming from different places uh, seek to take advantage of that. Um, uh, I meant more just as, uh, you know, in any, any, in any uh, migration situation, there are issues around how people are, uh, what conditions they're in, where they are, and some people are, um, you know, in, in, in kind of temporary uh, uh, circumstances in Central America, how they are resettled. Um, and so, you know, what we can do on a humanitarian basis, not an immigration basis, um, to address that is something um, that, you know, that, uh, that, that we'll be looking at going forward. And like I said, we have uh, assistance relationships with a lot of these countries, um, including on immigration issues. Um, my hope is that we're able to um, alleviate the humanitarian issue even as we recognize that um, uh, we're not going to be able to 
um, grandfather in a, a population under the wet foot, dry foot change. Oh, yeah. Oh, Guantanamo. Look, uh, you know, we'll, we're trying to reduce the population as much as we can through the last moment we're in office, so I'd expect that to continue. Um, and our goal is to leave, uh, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can to close it. Um, Congress has restrictions uh, on us uh, that have made that uh, impossible to do. Um, uh, but we're going to keep at this uh, as long as we're here. Um, and the population is now down to, I think, under 50 people. Um, part of what we're demonstrating is the absurdity of spending, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars to keep 40 or so people in a prison uh, where they're not being uh, tried and convicted just to make a point. I mean, there's really no, there's no policy reason to have a prison in Cuba that holds 40 people. It doesn't make any sense. Um, we've got plenty of facilities that can hold people. We've tried terrorists who are uh, just as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than a lot of the people at Guantanamo, and they're serving life sentences in our prisons right now. Um, every one that we detained, you know, the Boston Marathon bomber, the Times Square bomber, uh, Ahmed Borsami, uh, an al-Shabaab commander, um, Abu Qatala, uh, the alleged mastermind of uh, uh, the Benghazi attacks. Uh, these people are in our prisons. Um, so th there's just not an argument for why it makes sense to have a prison in Cuba that we're spending tens of millions of dollars to operate to hold 40 people, um, even though it isolates us internationally and uh, has been used time and again in terrorist recruitment material, propaganda material. Uh, moreover, if we started to add to the population in Guantanamo, um, I think it would significantly endanger our counterterrorism cooperation. Um, countries, one of the reasons why countries have worked closely with us to extradite terrorists is because they know where they're going. They're going to our justice system. Um, I think it would be a lot more difficult for European countries or Arab countries to hand over terrorist suspects who then get sent to Guantanamo. Um, that's a practical reality of governing. You know, it, it, you can sit and, uh, you know, armchair quarterback us and, you know, stack up the restrictions in Congress. Um, but if you have to try to work with other countries around the world to detain and extradite terrorists in the United States, um, the last thing that you want to do is make it impossible for those countries to do that. Uh, and so these are the types of issues uh, that I think will be confronted um, if there's any effort to to add to the population there. Yep. Um, reporter with Shenzhen Media Group. So last Friday, Mr. Trump said in an interview that um, the One China policy is negotiable. And but a few of his key nominations, including Mr. Rex Tillerson and James Mattis, said that they have seen no plans to alter the One China policy. So I just wonder. Has the current administration talked to or advised Mr. Trump on the issue, and what was his response? And how do you see the U.S. strategies to the Taiwan issue going under the, um, the incoming administration? Thank you. Well, I mean, it's not negotiable in the sense that our entire relationship with China is founded upon the One China policy. I mean, that was a basis for the Shanghai communique and the reestablishment of diplomatic relations, it, it's been negotiated. Um, I guess you could um, reopen it, but it, it, this, is a, this is an agreement we reached with the biggest country in the world, um, and it's a framework under which we do everything. Um, so uh, that's the first point I make. Uh, the second point I make is that we have maintained a productive relationship with Taiwan within the context of a one-China policy. Um, and, uh, y you know, the people of Taiwan continue to benefit from their uh, political system and uh, a very advanced economy, uh, even when that, within that context. Um, you know, the, the third point I make is that 
this is not something, I mean, China is not going to move on this. Um, so I don't, uh, you know, the, if, the, if there's one thing that you learn in dealing with China is that it, when they're dealing with uh, what they consider to be China, um, you know, they, they that's a different, they put that in a different bucket of issues and other other potential irritants. Um, so I, I, China's not going to negotiate anything. Um, uh, so I'm not sure what is accomplished by saying that, uh, you know, by pursuing a, an approach where you seek to reopen it. And finally, um, it's dangerous. Um, I mean, the um, the risk of escalation in the Taiwan Strait is um, just a flashpoint that the world does not need right now, um, and the United States certainly doesn't. So um, I would hope that, again, that the approach that's taken is one that sees the value of a constructive relationship with China. And look, um, they clearly want to take a tougher line on s some things, and, uh, you know, they'll do what, what they want to do. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, there's some valid um, – I think the – you know, we, we've warned the Chinese for years that some of the support for the relationship was eroding in our, in our business community and among our public because of perceived unfair trade practices. Um, and that manifests itself in, in cyber issues and uh, tariffs um, and, and state-owned enterprise uh, issues. So I do think that, you know, um, there's some expression being given by the new administration to a very real – sense in this country that uh, is this trade relationship, um, is, this, is this fair right now? And, and so I'm not suggesting that that doesn't make sense and, and the team might have some fresh thinking on how to, um, you know, take a firmer line on some of the areas where we have also had differences. But I think getting into the space of something like Taiwan um, uh, just risks uh, destabilizing that relationship without any potential benefit that I that I can foresee. Yeah. Thank you, Marcelo Nino from Folha de São Paulo, Brazilian newspaper. Um, the U.S.-Brazil uh, relations have uh, had some bumpy moments during uh, Obama administration, um, especially after the uh, disclosure of NSA uh, surveillance uh, over the um, Brazi former Brazilian president. Um, some say that this relationship uh, never uh, fully recovered. Looking back, how, how do you think the administration could have managed better uh, this crisis uh, to put the relations with the biggest um, uh, economy in Latin America uh, back on track? And since you mentioned in your Cuba um, uh, answer the um, Latin American policy, how did you see the, the Obama administration saw Brazil, uh, uh, what part did Brazil have in this uh, Latin American policy? Thank you. Well, on your first question, I think, you know, one of the, you know, we, we never really hit the timing right <laughs> with Brazil. Um, we, because there's so much natural um, benefit to cooperation. When we came in, we really wanted to prioritize this. I think one of the first conversations the president had was with Lula. Um, and I think the president feels a lot of affinity for Brazil, you know. Um, it's a relationship with unrealized potential in terms of what we could do together commercially, economically, uh, and also uh, in the region. Um, and we were beginning to build, I think, a very broad uh, and deep uh, uh, set of initiatives to cooperate um, around when the president visited. Um, and, uh, and that was beginning to bear fruit. You were seeing increased commercial activity, uh, interesting um, initiatives around energy cooperation, um, working with Brazil to try to um, w uh, address uh, development challenges in other countries, um, bringing them into initiatives like the Open Government Partnership, um, you know, peacekeeping uh, uh, cooperation, which is an issue we've hi highlighted in the international system. So we, we made good progress. Then uh, the disclosure, there's no country in the world where our relationship suffered more because of the disclosures in Brazil. Um, there's just no question about that. Um, and, you know, I, I, my, my own view is I, I don't think that was necessary. Um, 
you know, I think uh, it, it took on a life of, it, of its own in Brazil that nothing we said seemed to um, uh, matter <laughs> for, for a period of time. Um, and that may have also been because of, uh, you know, we, the information was disclosed clearly to have an effect on our relations with particular countries. Um, and Brazil and Germany were clearly almost kind of targets for trying to create friction in the relationship. And so it put, uh, to be sympathetic to Dilma, it put the Brazilian government in a very difficult position because there was just this drip, 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 drip of information that was intended to, to push the most provocative buttons. Uh, and we did make changes um, in our surveillance policies. Um, and and we briefed Brazil on those, and 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 I think as they began to understand um, that we were serious about addressing some of the concerns, um, the relationship opened back up. Um, they they felt heard uh, in their um, in their objections to what they were learning about in the disclosures, and we also frankly could explain to them how our intelligence surveillance programs work. And one of the uh, benefit is probably too strong of the word, but one, one of the um, outcomes of, uh, of those disclosures is, frankly, it, it forced us to have conversations with countries that we hadn't had before about, hey, look, here's how we do things, and here's why we do them this way, and here are the safeguards we're putting in place. And so ultimately, that did allow us to begin to rebuild the relationship. And Dilma had a good visit here, and, and uh, we were able to, to essentially reinvigorate a lot of the efforts that we were pursuing in commercial ties and economic ties. and. Uh, in some uh, defense areas um, and on some of these global issues I talked about. Brazil also was indispensable to the climate change um, uh, agreement. So uh, as with some other countries, I think the biggest thing we did with Brazil, frankly, was the Paris Agreement because um, you know, their contribution was, was indispensable. But then uh, Brazil had its own political crisis, and so that, you know, that kind of consumed just when the relationship was, I think, beginning to, to gain altitude again. Um, not because of any you know problems between us, but mainly just because there was an inward focus. Um, you know, I think that uh, uh, you know that that slowed down some of this progress. So, um, you know, I think we have a, a, a good record when we were cooperating of sh showing that that's good for the region and for both of our countries. Um, but I think that there's a higher ceiling of potential for what the U.S. and Brazil can do together. On Cuba, you know, I think Brazil is, um, you know. Brazil has been able to occupy a space that a, a number of countries have, but as a big country in particular in the region where, you know, they had good relations with Cuba uh, and relations with us. Um, so they, what, they weren't on kind of one side of a fight. You know, they weren't um, – uh, they, were, they were representing a view that – had a lot of credibility because of their size and influence in the in, in the hemisphere, and, and it wasn't from a position of pure ideology. It was, it was a practical uh, point that, that this policy is outdated, uh, that it, you're making it harder for all of us to work together with you, uh, that we can't continue to come to summits like some of the Americas and exclude Cuba. Um, uh, you know that has an impact, um, especially when we're hearing it from everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think, uh, uh, you know, that, that weighed on the president, you know, I mean, he wanted to do something on Cuba, but when you're, you, you know, you're also hearing about it from Brazil and, well, I won't start naming countries because I'd have to name all of them, um, you realize, well, wh what is the point of this? You know, <laughs> we're, we're, it's not working in Cuba and it's just making it impossible for me to, to go anywhere in this hemisphere uh, without Cuba being at the top of the uh, agenda. And so I think that, um, you know, that, that did help incentivize us to take the risk of doing the CUBE opening. Um, and I think, again, it also points to the risks of, of not continuing it. Yeah. Do you see, sorry, do you see the, um, especially as our President Trump as the beginning of the end of the world, uh, the, uh, not the world, but the liberal order of the world <laughs> and liberal <laughs> democracy? Obviously, I ask. <laughs> I ask because um, he has said things about NATO and EU, I don't even have to repeat them because they're so outrageous, uh, that makes, I think, everyone 
in this country who are concerned about the transatlantic alliance, extremely concerned and um, for the future of that alliance. And in particular, it is uh, not only strange, but it's really upsetting that I'm co I come from Denmark. My name is Martin Burkhardt. I'm from uh, a newspaper there called Information. That Danish sold soldiers have fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. We have actually taken more casualties per capita than the United States. To hear that uh, NATO is not doing anything to combat terrorism, uh, that is not a very helpful comment. So I wonder what would you suggest to Trump if you had him in the room now? Uh, <laughs> l l let me just. So I, I don't I, – look, the president has given his defense of the liberal international order repeatedly. Um, um, uh, you know, I think the UN speech he gave uh, this year I think is a, the, the best distillation of it. Um, I, I'd say a couple of things just on NATO. Uh, your point is very important here. Um, you know, when we came into office in 2009, we had to surge forces in Afghanistan. and. Uh, we had to do that because, you know, frankly, the, the plotting that we saw in Afghanistan and Pakistan was directed at Europe, but a lot of it was directed at us. And we had to go around and ask NATO allies to either sustain or increase their contributions to a war that their publics had totally soured on. Um, that, was, that was hard. Uh, and just about everybody stepped up um, with no political upside to it. I mean, it's not like any leader – uh, got a boost from, you know, continuing their ISAF contribution. Um, that's what an alliance is, though. Um, uh, you know, we – I used to see, you know, the casualty notices, uh, you know, every day um, th for ISAF. Uh, that would include uh, people from any number of, of, of NATO countries and other allies, and you think when you see that, that – uh, you know, in, in small countries, these are, uh, you know, these are enormous losses in a conflict that seems pretty distant from um, the politics and, and life in those countries. So uh, NATO allies have made enormous sacrifices uh, in defense of the United States. Um, yes, in defense of their security as well. I mean, terrorists – uh, did attack European cities, um, you know, uh, like London and Madrid, uh, you know, in the pre-ISIL uh, threat picture. But um, the fact that that sacrifice continued so long after uh, the pu public opinion had shifted on, on the war, after the war in Iraq that had been so divisive, you know, yes, we've had differences about defense budgets. Um, but not about the value of this alliance and, and not about the willingness to sacrifice your most precious resource, your people, um, for a mission that, uh, you know, has been – was largely driven by the United States. Um, so I think we, we should never disrespect the, the loss of life that NATO allies have undertaken on our behalf. Um, and by the way, that's not in a – a counter-Russian effort. Uh, blood was spilled by NATO to fight terrorism uh, for the, the last 15 years. Um, that's, you know, um, that's, what, that's what an alliance is. So that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing is that America gets a lot out of these alliances. Um, and I think that there's a there's a lack of appreciation in this country for for just how much we benefit from these alliances. Um, you know, I think there's a presumption that it's costly and we have to put troops in these places. You know, first of all, just from a very basic level, um, our military has a global network of allies and partners um, that allow us to do everything that we do uh, in Japan, um, a country with you know, a very strong sense of sovereignty. Um, the fact that uh, those troops, um, you know, uh, 
that's to, that's for our benefit as well as theirs. Um, it goes both ways. Um, the fact that Germany hosts uh, – that is the hub of our tr – how we move uh, wounded warriors out of Iraq um, and save their lives. That's how we move, uh, uh, you know, our special forces around uh, to key theaters. Uh, th you know, that – and th the same can be said of any country that hosts an American military installation. That is to our benefit as well as to the benefit of countries that are hosting us. Um, uh, try doing anything that the U.S. military does without that. It would be impossible. Uh, we depend – our doctrine depends on having allies and having forward deployed uh, bases. And, uh, you know, I think that has to be uh, a part of the conversation in, in ways that it hasn't been. Um, and so that – again, that doesn't get into the liberal international order, which I, I think, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time speaking about. Um, basically, you know, to distill it down into a paragraph, I mean, President Obama's whole view of how the world should operate is, is premised on a liberal international order in which rules and institutions uh, incentivize nations to resolve their differences peacefully, to promote prosperity, to cooperate in dealing with challenges that are global. And alliances are literally the core of that order. Without alliances, our voice in every international body is minimized even though we're the most powerful country in the world. Um, and, and we would do, be doing great harm to ourselves um, to walk away from that. But all that said, I'm not, uh, I'm not entirely pessimistic uh, um, because, because the, the incentives are just overwhelming to pursue that approach. Uh, and I think, frankly, the cost of turning away from it will be pretty evident if that's what happens. The pendulum has to swing uh, back, uh, in, in my judgment. And, and the one thing I'd say is, you know, he was sounding the alarm bells about this in Brussels and Hanover, uh, you know, giving speeches about Europe that uh, you frankly don't often hear about uh, from European leaders. I think everybody needs to realize that these are things that we could lose um, and that they need to be spoken up for, that um, we can't just kind of price in. Um, the fact that this liberal international order or transatlantic alliance will be there. Um, and so what I hope is there's now a more vigorous effort from political leaders and from citizens to stand up for these things in these countries and that ultimately that's going to be the thing that, uh, again, causes this um, uh, pendulum to swing back to an appreciation of what we gain from that type of um, cooperation. And there's just too much common interest in that working uh, for, I think, for things to go off the rails uh, in a way that is is irredeemable, um, so uh, so hope hope springs eternal. Um, yeah. Hey, uh, Brian Harris with the Yomari Shimbun, the Japanese newspaper. Um, you kind of touched on this a little bit before, but just um, to get even more specific, at his confirmation hearing, Rex Tillerson suggested blocking off access to uh, Chinese constructed islands in the South China Sea. Um, I was wondering if you could assess the wisdom of that approach and what would your advice be to the incoming administration about dealing with the South China Sea issue? And then on Yemen, this administration has repeatedly condemned uh, basically Russian war crimes in Syria, but Saudi Arabia, which the U.S. is backing there, has also committed similar war crimes, bombing hospitals, schools. So I guess how do you justify the U.S. approach to Yemen and backing Saudi Arabia in contrast with what Russia is doing in Syria? Mm. So um, on the first question, you know, I, I, we, we have not thought that military confrontation uh, would be the right approach to the South China Sea. Um, I do think that, that those comments reflect a growing concern, though, that, you know, China has been pushing the envelope um, in its uh, actions and its, uh, uh, you know, uh, militarization of certain structures in ways that are potentially destabilizing. Um, w our approach has been, and I think what, you know, we would encourage is uh, to focus uh, a significant amount of time and attention to trying to form a regional uh, um, approach. In other words, if the conflict is distilled to tests of strength between individual claimants, China and, and individual claimants, uh, it's going to have one ending. 
if, if ASEAN is able to, to, to form a collective position and, and stick behind it, um, and frankly, we can support that effort by the type of network we've tried to build among our allies, you know, where the Japanese uh, are deepening their cooperation with Australia and with India um, and with uh, uh, individual ASEAN countries, you know, that ultimately that's not to, to, to take on China. That's to say that there is a large group of countries that have a, a shared interest in, you know, there being freedom of navigation and peaceful resolution of dispute and um, the conversation is, begins from a set of principles and that there, there, there are countries that are willing to stand behind that collectively. Uh, and that, that, that gives us a basis to have uh, a more constructive engagement with China. Um, I, I, you know, the, the, otherwise the risk is, look, I mean, uh, uh, the, the risk is that uh, if this is turned into a zero-sum competition over individual uh, rocks, reefs, uh, structures, um, I don't think that benefits anybody. I think everybody loses because, um, uh, you know, ultimately there's so much investment in uh, you turn it into a nationalist issue and, and make it harder and harder for countries to, to back down from their positions. It has to be treated as an international issue, um, uh, as difficult as that is. Exception would be, and it's not the South China Sea, but, you know, we took the position we did on the Senkakus because we have a treaty alliance. Um, that, that is a, a commitment of ours because, again, you, you, know, you have a treaty obligation. Uh, on Yemen, um, the distinction we draw from Syria um, is that there, there's a basis for uh, what uh, the, the Saudi-led coalition um, was seeking to achieve in that you know, they were getting, um, you know, basically they're getting missiles launched into their territory. They were having skirmishes across their border. There was an external um, threat that they're seeking to address. Uh, we have repeatedly um, been concerned by uh, the, the way in which they um, approach the military campaign, particularly when we've seen more indiscriminate bombing. Um, uh, nothing on the scale of Syria, but nonetheless, every every innocent life lost in, in, in a military conflict is a tragedy. And when you have, um, a, you know, a, a lack of um, discretion in how you c carry out your military operations, you know that 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 raises our concerns. And that's you know, so we've sought to try to calibrate how are we relating to that effort, uh, and we sought to prioritize a, a, a political track um, so that. Uh, you know, there's a, a pathway to de-escalation. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, and Secretary Kerry has been working on this up through now. Um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I think there has to be a way in which countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE uh, can feel like they're not going to have to just accept, um, you know, a, a growing threat on their borders and even hostile actions into their territory, um, there's a way for them to address that and have some deterrent against that um, without the kind of open-ended um, military campaign that we've seen in Yemen. Uh, and, uh, y you know, the, um, we'll, we'll see the approach that the, the new team takes, but, you know, I think focusing on the political track and, you know, what we've tried to do, for instance, is focus on, you know, we can deploy patriots, we can help secure that border and we can help support a more targeted efforts, um, uh, uh, you know, th that's the role that, that the United States should play. Um, and, and I think, you know, we have expressed concerns when it, the military efforts went, went far beyond that. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, today's last briefing. Uh, I have, uh, my name is Tatsuya Mizumaro from Gigi Press. I have a question about North Korea. Uh, during eight years, uh, obviously their nuclear program has been advanced. They have done 
three or four nuclear tests, and then they launched a lot of uh, the missiles. Do you believe um, you have done the best job against North Korea? And then do you have any advice to a new administration how to about how to deal with North Korea? Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, when I look back on it, I, I don't know what we could have done differently. I mean, they had a nuclear weapon, I mean, we, we, or, you know, they, they had tested a nuclear weapon uh, by the time we took office. Um, I think that um, we have sought to, to take the responsible steps necessary to ensure that we can defend against that. And, and so I think the THAAD deployment, uh, I think the work we've done to try to keep the, the cooperation trilaterally between us and the ROK and Japan on track, uh, the other investments we've made in missile defense in, in Northeast Asia, um, you know, are, are the types of responsible things that we need to do to address uh, at least how to uh, contain this threat and defend ourselves. Um, the diplomatic opening really just never presented itself. Um, no one has ever accused me of being uh, reluctant to engage in diplomacy. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but I, there just, it never, there was never a window that was open. There, there was just never a sense that the North Koreans were at all serious. Um, and uh, I think the Chinese have gotten more concerned about this um, and more uh, serious about it. Um, but I think it's going to be a, a predominant challenge for the next team, and it would have been in any case, no matter who won our election. Um, you know, I, I, I do think there has to be some way to, and this is frankly why it's good to have a constructive relation with China. There has to be some way to have a discussion with China that envisions where this is all going, um, that, uh, you know, that, that, that can lead to some more uh, assertive action on their part. Um, you know, I think they're worried about the uncertainties um, of destabilization uh, on the Korean Peninsula that might come from pressure that they apply, but the, the status quo is frankly more destabilizing, I think, than, um, than the alternative of, 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 of them applying even greater pressure. We've gotten them, I think, to enforce much stronger sanctions, and we'll see how those uh, uh, what, 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 what those yield, and it may just be that that has to uh, sink in um, to affect North Korea's calculus. Um, the last thing I'd just say is I, I've always thought that, um, you know, there, 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 there might be more thought in terms of how we are able to reach the North Korean people, um, and not just with, you know, the, um, you know, uh, and this is not to criticize, so I just want to <laughs> disclaimer. But the, you know, loudspeakers, leaflets, you know, that it's not reaching a lot of people, you know. And, and, and uh, I do feel like the the um, the information vacuum there is, is is potentially greater than it needs to be. Um, and there's some interesting efforts to just try to get some greater connectivity between North Koreans and the rest of the world, um, because um, that too, I think. Ultimately, you know, the only pressure that really matters is pressure from within, in, uh, in some cases, and, and, and there doesn't seem to be much of that. Uh, we've got time for a couple more. Uh, Andre! Andre's mad at me because uh, I, I reneged on an interview with him. I had good excuses both times. One was that we were giving sanctions that day, and then the other was the birth of my daughter. So, uh, so I apologize, Andre, but... Uh, I, First, the first day we were introducing, uh, first congratulations on your Thank you. uh, the birth of your daughter. And, uh, you were introducing uh, the sanctions, uh, the, the recent batch, uh, on the day when uh, Russia was mourning uh, her ambassador in Turkey, who had been lost to a terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. Why did you pick that day? For the sanctions? For, yes, for, for introducing uh, sanctions, new, new sanctions. Your, your, yeah. your own Dr. Wallander was uh, at the Russian embassy that day expressing condolences. That was that was, the exact That, was, uh, that I, was on the one hand. Was uh, and and uh, no, it, it, did not, uh, it did not happen. It did not happen on the, on the day, uh, on the day uh, yeah. when, he, when he died. Yeah. 
but when she was when she was at the embassy, when she came to to the embassy to express condolences, uh, I, I'm told that's not true. Uh, the, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so any, anyways, uh, needless to say, I'm, I'm, uh, it's 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 not the way I remember it, but I'm bad with uh, dates. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, it was the same day, uh, but. Uh, Obviously, I'm, I'm uh, very sad, uh, not about the interview, but about what's going on in our relations. And, uh, Yours and mine, or U.S. and Russia? Uh, <laughs> no, 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 U.S. US, US and Russia. And, and then the question, like you just answered, what could have been done differently, yeah. but what, what's the point now? There is almost nothing to ask at, at, at this point. Uh, you know, uh, in Russian, there is a saying that you swing your fists after the fight. This is what you are doing. Uh, obviously, you swing the fists at Russia, but you aim the blows at uh, Donald Trump. We understand that. Uh, it's, 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 it's obvious. Uh, it's awkward. Uh, to, are you, to put are you, are you suggesting that expelling Russian intelligence in a, agents in a, in a, is uh, put, hitting Donald to Trump? Put it in a, uh, you undermine uh, the legitimacy of the question by blowing out of all proportion and by providing no proof whatsoever uh, about Russian interference in the uh, political affairs of, of the United States. Uh, you undermine the legitimacy of your own new president. Uh, my, my question, to put it in a, in a question form, uh, uh, give me an example. A historic example where a similar thing happened, where a new president was elected, and he was systemically, uh, deliberately. I worked, I worked for that president. He was delegitimized from the first day that he was in office in this country. By, by whom? <laughs> I, 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 look, let, let me, let me, let me, I won't go down that road because that's too, that's too easy. Um, um, what, do you want to finish or? Uh, no, no, yeah. um, um, so, with respect to the actions that we took, um, there's, there's, there, look, I, I've worked on a lot of, uh, around a lot of intelligence assessments. That, that there's not any, there's no doubt, this is not a, um, a questionable case. Um, it is plainly evident to all of our intelligence agencies based on all the different types of reporting that they have that Russia was behind the hacking um, of uh, American political organizations and that that information was uh, provided to parties who were going to disclose uh, those materials uh, for uh, a political purpose. Um, it's an insult to our intelligence to suggest that that didn't happen right in front of our eyes. Uh, the, 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 um, the, uh, the, look, the, this, but, but let me t maybe take it more broadly. Um, we have some European journalists here. Th this is happening all over Europe, uh, and it's not, it's not hard to see. Uh, I mean, we, I don't know how many European leaders we've met with who said that something new has entered into their politics, that there is a, a systematic effort to disseminate information uh, that is intended to uh, provoke European disunity, that is intended to undermine uh, more liberally oriented leaders, including those who've uh, supported things like Ukraine sanctions. Um, you know, we hear it in Italy, in Germany, uh, and, 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 and the Germans have, have already gone public with what's happening in their elections. So, both on the uh, surveillance that you acknowledged and on the regime change, there are scores of examples where uh, Americans have been doing this and worse. But, but Andre. But, and this, so, what you are claiming, uh, has again, has no proof. Your, your intelligence says it happened, but your intelligence has been wrong so many times, including on Iraq, as we all know. I'm, I'm, I'm almost... Uh, let me, uh, um, 
Let me start at the beginning. Um, this president had no hostility towards Russia. Um, I remember him giving an interview to you, Andre, in the White House. Uh, we came in and had or your, to your news organization. Um, we got a lot done with uh, Dmitry Medvedev. Um, uh, we got the New START Treaty done. We got we supported Russia's entry in the WTO, um, even though there wasn't really any political benefit in that for us. We thought that was fair. Uh, the repeal of Jackson Vanek. Um, we couldn't have gotten an Iran deal without Russia, and I've repeatedly credited Russia with that. We, we pro what, is so, what is so frustrating about this whole conversation is we clearly had a preference to work with Russia. Um, uh, if anything, you know, that is something our critics have seized on. And frankly, I still think that was the right thing to do, because when you have an opportunity of someone who's willing to work with you, you take it. Uh, and that's what we had in the first term with uh, President Medvedev. And, and we got a lot done that I think benefited the United States and Russia. Um, we did not go in search of um, a conflict in Ukraine. Um, we actually su we, we supported the agreement that was brokered in which Yanukovych would have stayed. Uh, he's the one who decided to leave. Um, and, you know, we have a, a responsibility as a, a stakeholder in the international community that after that happens, when there's an effort to annex the territory of a sovereign country, to respond um, and for there to be consequences. Uh, absent that, the whole order collapses, and, and we're just living in the law of the jungle. Uh, and that ultimately is bad, I think, for everybody, uh, including Russia. Um, in terms of our surveillance and intelligence efforts, uh, look, you know, we, we get it. Um, countries um, spy on each other. Um, uh, a bunch of countries do that. Uh, there's a difference, though, between um, regular efforts to understand what's happening in another country and uh, have that inform your policies, and then disseminating information to interfere in the politics of other countries. Um, and, and, and frankly, that uh, you know, it, it, you're asking us to suspend disbelief to suggest that um, Tori and Ulan's phone conversation gets intercepted and released, and uh, the fake news is created uh, all uh, across European countries. Um, that uh, you know how many uh, there have been plenty of reports about um, that are intended to promote. Uh, you know, see doubt uh, and division inside of Europe to um, elevate the concerns about refugees, um, fake stories about what refugees um, are doing in Europe, crimes that they're committing. Um, uh, there is direct funding and support for political parties with a, of a particular bent um, in European countries. This is all, um, this is all plain for people to see. Um, and, and I think that the, the problem here is um, we respect that Russia will have its own interests. Um, the, the, the basic problem is we're, we're not operating even from a position of trying to establish any facts for how we address issues. Um, you know, uh, a, a, a civilian airliner is shot down over Ukraine, and uh, on the one hand, we have, you know, professionals painstakingly recreating the entire airplane and doing a lengthy investigation to arrive at a fact-based conclusion as against just all types of different theories and information being put out by Russia about what happened. And, and that's what plays out time and again. And I, I, we, they rebuilt the entire plane that was blown out of the sky, Andre. I mean, they're, they're they, they, We did release that. We've released satellite imagery of all kinds of things in Ukraine. We've released satellite imagery of trucks with weapons crossing the border. I mean, I, I don't like at a certain point. I'm sorry. Just for curiosity's sake, one last thing. When President Putin refused to take the bait and expel American diplomats, what was the reaction from President Obama? Just I'm personally curious. Could you repeat the question? 
I'll repeat it because let, let's. I have to move on. I'll take one last question. I have this just so I end on a happier note. Um, the, um, the he didn't have a reaction under it. We we took an action because it was in our national interest um, to do so. Uh, here's this is an President Obama is not somebody who personalizes um, disputes with foreign countries. I mean, everything that all of you have seen in how he interacts with countries, he represents the United States of America. He represents a set of interests and values. Um, you know, he, he, he doesn't approach these things as um, duels uh, or, uh, you know, and frankly, he's always believed that the measure of his uh, efforts as president is how strong is America and how are we positioned. And uh, look, our we feel very good about the work that we've done to strengthen the American economy, the American social safety net, uh, social inclusion in America, to promote a broader set of relations in the world. Uh, and and you know, frankly, that is the measure by which we look at how strong we are. Um, and you know, frankly, I, I, my concern is, that, um, is also that I don't see this benefiting the Russian uh, people. I know that you know, they're not interested uh, in my view in Moscow on this, but, you know, the, um, we, we could have a, a situation where there's much greater economic growth and much less tension and, and, and we're cooperating as we have historically on areas like arms control and even European uh, security. Um, and I just think that even as someone who's not going to be in this job in three days, that is so clearly better for everybody, um, including Russia. Um, the, the, no, 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 I, I got to move on just because um, I look, we want Trump to succeed as President of the United States, um, uh, you know, I, but we also believe that um, uh, the liberal international order that every president of every party since World War II has invested in is, 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 a, is got to be part of the foundation of, of, of our approach to the world. I'll take one last question because I think I got to run. Um, we'll, I'll go here. Um. <coughs> My name is Sanna Björling. I'm a s Swedish reporter from Dagens Nyheter, a Swedish newspaper. Um, I wonder if the Nordic countries <coughs> have very good and close relationships with uh, the United States, NATO members or not. Uh, Sweden has, during the Obama years, um, deepened its relationships, bilateral relationships with the United States. And now we have the Nordic summit last spring that was considered a, a huge success. And uh, a lot of this, of course, takes place with the long-term actions of Russia in the background. And I wonder if you have spoken to the, the incoming administration about Scandinavia and the Nordic countries. So um, I haven't personally, but I know, you know President Obama uh, always holds out the Nordic countries as the model of, of global citizenry. Um, you know, what is striking about how we've been able to cooperate is that it, it, it's yes, it's bilateral issues and multilateral issues, but it's what we're doing together on development around the world, or, or what we're doing in the Arctic um, to address both security and environmental concerns. Um, and and that, that, you know, frankly, if people are looking for a model of uh, of how to be a stakeholder in the international system that we uh, we're talking about, um, you know, I think the Nordic countries. They contribute to our uh, security efforts. They've contributed to our counterterrorism efforts. They are close commercial partners, but they also have a, a sense of altruism and uh, a sense that their own uh, future is better when people on the other side of the world can have uh, healthier lives and safer drinking water and can resolve uh, conflicts peacefully. Um, you know that I think is a mindset that everybody has to. Um, get back to um, because uh, you know in the long run the interesting thing is that even as there's this return to a more populist approach to politics in a lot of places and a more nationalist approach um, the the issues that are going to be of concern to people going forward are less national uh, they are global uh, climate uh, pandemic disease cyberspace uh, that is uh, interwoven across borders um, migration flows. Um, so, you know, ultimately that is why I feel like um, that the strain that cuts against that type of approach 
um, is just going to run into a hard reality, um, wherein it's going to be incapable of solving the problems that that exist in the world. Um, so that's a long way of saying um, I don't know, if, you know how specifically President Obama has discussed the Nordic countries, but I knew, know that he frequently holds them out as as a model of, of international um, cooperation and, and citizenship. Great. Thanks, thanks everybody. Sorry to run, but thank you uh, all again for um, um, eight years of uh, good, uh, good and spirited uh, um, dialogue on, on, on a lot of important issues. Thanks. Thank you very much.